so Johnny, what, what does the word folk mean when you, you hear it? Does it put you off and you think, you know, bearded sort of people with fingers in their ears? I kind of um, made my sort of associations with it a long time ago and I think what it means to me is, is um, uh, ancient, really. And with that, what I like about that ancient thing, for me, because I came at it musically, mm -hmm. I came at it about guitar, really, yeah. um, the, what it, it's, uh, it's, to me, it's quite psychedelic. Yeah. And, and so the, the stuff that I like, the folk that I like, has always managed to bypass that kind of shanty. Never was interested in that. Um, the kind of seafaring aspect of it. Never really was that interested in that kind of guttural sort of singing, the whole finger in the ear stuff. And um, I came to the, the words and the sort of poetry side, mm. um, which to a lot of other people is, is, is what it is. Yeah. But I came to that as a byproduct of these sort of more kind of esoteric musicians, really. Yes, yes. And so um, I, what I like about it is it's kind of witchy. Um, for me, it, it, it could be so the, the thing that you might that you describe the sort of folky finger in the ear thing mm. is essentially very alcohol. Yeah. But what I like is more sort of psilocybin, really, to put it in those kind of terms. It's that ancient kind of from the woods kind of witchy yes, sort yes. of aspect that I suppose psych folk has come to take, really. It's tapped into it, hasn't it? Because yeah. that was what I always liked about folk very early on, was that area where it seemed to tap into something. Because I came into folk in a way, I guess, like I came through a lot of things through Mark Boland. Because then I went to Tyrannosaurus right. Rex. And it was a completely different thing from T-Rex, but it was filled with, you know, this kind of magic in the woods and the mystery and, and, and something kind of quite exotic and psychedelic. And then through that, you know, I found Roy Harper because on Roy Harper's Folk Joke Opus, in the corner on the back, there was all these, all these scribbles and he put to Mark and June. Right. You know, so so yeah, I thought, course, oh, yeah. I must find that. Do you know what I mean? So you know how things spread out from a, a strange source and suddenly you're into this whole new world. And yeah. For me, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was that, it was that mystery and an Englishness and a a strangeness that, that, that seemed to go back deep into to the past that, that was unbelievably mysterious. Well, that's, well the word, I think, is, is exotic, I think. Yeah. Because, it, again, the, the thing that folk, that th come back to that thing that it represents for a lot of people, a sort of, you know, um, essentially the Ewan McCall kind of thing. Yes. Or, and, the, and the sense of the working man. I mean, there's that whole strain of it, the political sense yes. of it. To, to, the problem I have with that is the music yeah. and the tunes. The, it's just not exotic Because enough. it's strangely kind of square for, for the radical sentiments, isn't it? It's like the music seems to somehow oppose the, the sentiments yeah. that, that are radical and progressive, and yet the music itself is quite conservative. Well, very simply, it just always sounded like the, the same tune to me, yeah. and a tune I didn't very much care for. But the other side of it um, as well, it, with the, um, the kind of... It's interesting you mentioned T-Rex, because obviously... I mean, the, um, you know, I, I loved all of that stuff because I loved bowling. I yeah. kind of just took that on board as well, really. So I just got into it by, by default really, yeah. because I was such a bowling freak. Yeah. And um, uh, what he's taking there, though, is this, you know, I guess, you know, there's the, again, it's that ancient, trippy, um, kind of mysterious factor that, see, the interesting thing, I think, with the difference between, say, Americans doing folk, that you know what folk is in america you know is blue obviously it's sort of more bluegrass and mm. appalachian music and all of that um but when americans try and do say the psych folk movement and there's a lot of good bands you know six organs and yeah, yeah. And, and wooden ships and stuff like that what they're doing when they do folk they're doing british folk they're, they're yes. doing the psychedelic aspect that america doesn't really well, have. also what i thought happened with a lot of those bands that now get termed psych folk and freak folk and new folk and old folk and all of that it's almost like if you imagine that incredible tradition that was happening in British folk in the 70s that had reached Fairport and it had reached Fotheringay and Nick Drake and everything and, and Martin Carthy and Bert Jansen, somehow punk completely knocked it for six, completely knocked it out of the water. And it's almost like there's been a, a weird joining up again of what might have happened if some of those musicians had taken on board what was happening around, you know, the experimental side of punk, you know, yeah. the post-punk thing. Because it's almost like a, a psych folk is the, is the post-punk version of what was happening in... in British folk anyway, but somehow yeah. seemed to just come to a juddering halt because they couldn't, they, they somehow thought that, that, that it was not for them, you know, and yeah, yeah. It, it, for me it was a, a, a kind of really interesting moment. Well, the Velvet know? Underground sound folky, you know, and therefore so do, um, I mean, there's an amazing track, I think, a great track on 
um, moving ahead a little bit, but yeah. still, I think talk, you know, was what you're talking about. The late Stephen Malmus in the Jix record has got a track called Wicked Wonder, Wicked Wonder on it. Yeah, that is kind of you know, it's Stephen Malmus doing it's his yeah. thing, which yeah. has got slightly Lou Reedy vibe about yeah. it. But the approach is that sort of five in the morning. I mean. Lou Reedy sort of Elvis thing, yes. and the lyrics "Wicked Wonder," you know, it's, yeah. it's very folky yeah. but still contemporary. Yeah. But then, I, I probably like it for the same reason that I like Faust. Yeah. You know, which you know, some of the best, some of the most beautiful stuff that Faust did, is is, you know, it's like folky. It might have an it electric is, it, guitar yeah. in it, and it's all coming from that same place, you know. Yes. And they were completely uncompromising, weren't they? Well, they were never swayed. And, and like Roy Harper's a classic example. There he is, sort of at the edges of Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. That whole kind of world that he could have gone into, but he still somehow pulls away. He doesn't get drawn into that world. He he sticks to his guns. Doesn't well, he? I think he. It sounded like to me um, that he was, he was the underground they were taking from. Yeah. Because yeah. you listen to some of their records. I mean, obviously Led Zeppelin did. You know they. The, the, the song that was named after him, mm. but so Pink Floyd stuff, Animals, sounds a lot like what he was doing on guitar. Sure. The chord changes and yeah. the, basically the acoustic guitar going through uh, modulation, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, he, and he sings on. I mean, my favourite Floyd vocal is is, is, yeah. is Roy Harper. Yeah, yeah. I have a cigar. Yeah, because yeah. he's got that kind of bile. Yeah, to me, he was somewhere. He was as trippy. He's some, just between Sid Barrett and John Lennon for me, well, right? Because the old prog rock thing, in its worst kind of incarnation, sort of had a sentimentality, almost a self pity about it that people like Roy Harper never really had, did they? You know, they didn't have that about them, and therefore they couldn't fall for for, for what the Led Zeppelins went off and did, and the Pink Floyds. There was quite, something quite self piteous about that, wasn't there? Well, that's interesting because he's a fascinating person. I think maybe what you're talking about is it might have to, I don't know I mean it's, it's a big long shot but it might have something to, to do with the fact that he was an orphan and yeah. he, you know he's he's quite a tough tough character yeah. I think yeah. and he is um, I think Roy Harper it's funny because because of his you know he's got his Mancunian accent and right. he's got his attitude there always seems to be strangely with, with him for something that's supposed to be so pastoral I always hear a lot of concrete in, yeah. Yeah. in Roy Harper's music yeah. it's quite urban yes yeah. So I, I, I'm interested about the guitar thing, because in a way, when Martin Carthy say, take Martin Carthy, started playing the guitar in the 50s and 60s, it's oddly a, an unusual and eccentric thing for a British person to do in a way. It's almost like the beginning of a certain guitar story, isn't it? You know, in terms of where he took it from. He, you know, he kind of tells me about listening to Elizabeth Cotton, you know, the, the elderly blues, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and finding a new way of playing and then mixing that with, with a folk kind of an English folk style. And, and almost developing a new way of playing. And then, you know, David Graham comes along, Bert Jans comes along. And it seems to be that this was what you were responding to, you know, the way that they were opening up the guitar to all sorts of sonic possibilities. Yeah, that, that's right. I think uh, Bert, I mean, I've said this before, but Bert Jans is playing, um, and David Graham's, I think, as, um, is actually quite violent, you know. Um, it, there's, a, there's so much attack. It's true that Bert um, will never, if you record him, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, mm. just play, playing the same song, he will never play it exactly the same way. Now, if it's a song he's been playing for 30 years, it's always slightly different. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, and so there's a sort of, uh, there's a rebelliousness about it too, on an acoustic, which is really killer. Mm. And um, I think Neil Young is hearing. Mm. I think he's tapped yeah. into it. Yeah. And um, it, it sounded... Um, very, it, it made me think, and occasionally I do go through these phases where uh, I, I can sometimes think that a voice and an acoustic guitar in a tuning or is just, is an incredible picture. Mm -hmm. It's giant. I don't see it as being mm. a little picture sure. with yeah. things missing. Yeah. I think it's it's got this giant, massive scope. It's, it's interesting the the cliched um, influences that people talk about with you and say the Smiths. They always talk about certain things, but they never often talk about this area. You know, and there was a list of music you sent me. You know, you, Roy Harper, you suggest Bert Jansch, Clive's original band, Clive Palmer from the Incredible String Band. Yeah. And Jackson C. Frank as well. Oh yeah. You know, and and and, and what's interesting is when you hear this music, you're kind of hearing little blueprints of the Smiths in a funny sort of way because, you know, the, the, the vocal lines are, are quite Baroque 
the whole kind yeah. of combination of the guitar chiming and, and doing right. all sorts of resonant runs, it seemed to be such a factor in, 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 in what you were doing at that time, let alone later, do you know what I mean? Well, that's interesting because, yeah, I think um, people maybe, they jump to the, uh, the conclusion about folk because they maybe hear the tip of the iceberg, they hear a, a, an arpeggio um, and, um, you know, uh, no blues chord changes and, and mm. those kind of things. And, um, but actually, there's that, um, there's that uh, sort of search of... I think when we did our best stuff, it had that real huge melancholic mm. thing in it, but I'm not really even talking about the lyrics. You, you know, aside from no, the lyrics, yes. it is got... I mean, I think you once said it was like ancient and modern at the same time, yeah. which I, th well, I thought really was a good way of nailing it. I was... Because uh, the, it's, it, it does get into the realms of um, esoteric, I think. And, you know, I was, I was trying to capture a feeling that was um, really dark, but someplace you wanted to be. Yes. You know, and I'm not, as a person, I was never really particularly interested in, in, um, in English history. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't, I had other things to think about. But, um, and I'm still not really, because mm -hmm. I've got other things to think about. But, <laughs> But but the feeling it evokes yeah. um, is quite a sort of like a sort of delicious sort of heaviness really. That but you're, I, that but I you're like. bringing it forward though, even if you're not knowing. Yeah. Directly. Well, that's when I feel I've got something good no going. There's no doubt that you are, and I think you're bringing it forward through listening to Bert Yanch and through listening to Davy Graham and and Clive. I, I've got a feeling it's 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 an Englishness that goes back for centuries that's still with, with you. Well, I and hence not so much the blue. I hear it in Metal Guru. <laughs> yeah. I really don't. I know what it is. It's down, down, down. With cellos, really, like you've got that thing and you overstate the hell out of it. Yeah. yeah. And I hear it in that. Yeah. Even, you know, forgetting the, the Tyrannosaurus Rex stuff. Mm. I mean, King of the Rumbling Spires, you've got it in. That's, that's the whole jackpot for me, yeah. really. <laughs> you know, it, it is that. It's, uh, it, it's got to be like. Um, it is evoked, literally, it is evoking something. Yeah. And then, you know, you do get into the realms of the spirits and the spirit world and all of that. And that, yeah. I think that's why probably I'm thinking about, um, you know, the sort of psilocybin kind of aspect yes. of it. It's not like, a, obviously, a hedonism thing. Yeah. It's the sort of, um, it, it, you know, it is sort of, it, and, and it's uh, sort of tree spirits and nature and all of that. But actually, that isn't at all to me, um, that, isn't a, that really isn't a sort of a walk in the park. Mm. You know, it's a sort of like, you know, it's a real sort of uh, five o'clock in the morning in the woods sort yeah, of thing, really. Sure. And that, you know, and St. John of the Cross and the whole bit, really. So you, you end up collaborating with people like Bert Yange. Yeah. So uh, how's that feel? I mean, what's that like? Um, it, it feels really great because, uh, um, because what happens is, you know, for all, you know, for all the, you know, who we are and mm. this is great and everything, um, it has to be sorted out in the first 30 seconds of playing, whether it's bullshit or not. Mm -hmm. And with me and Bert, we can play, just go around and round for a few hours and just do that, yeah. really. Yeah. And um, uh, so, so it's real, mm -hmm. you know. He was the only person that I ever really tried to work out stuff mm -hmm. as a guitar player, and fairly unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. And it's true that if you actually sit in front of him and watch what he's doing, it's, it's harder. It's better to just try and work it out by ear because he, you need like a mirror and you have to stand on your head and yeah. to work out how he's doing it. It's, it's just this sort of primal mm. thing. A lot of it is from, from there, you know. Yeah. Um, but we, um, and it's very gratifying for me because he, you know, he's been very gracious and he's, he's you know, paid me a lot of compliments. But I do feel like the connection that I, I thought I had with this guy when I was sitting in my bedroom, mm. I, I mean, first off, off of how lucky am I to actually get to really do it? Mm. There's that, but uh, it kind of paid off because we do work pretty well together without me aping him. Mm. I don't ape him; I have my own thing. So what kind of conversation are you having in a way? Um, it, well, it's uh, absolutely not at all about technique, mm -hmm. and it, it's about mystery, really. Like, um, don't isn't it great that we're not? We both know we're not going to analyze it, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think we both feel like we're both pu pulling from the same source, mm. uh, and we both understand that that's that's uh, that's a, that itself 
is a mystery where that, where that's coming from. Mm. I think that's what it is. Mm. I think you make that connection with music when it really hits you and touches you, like it was with Metal Groove that I always go on about. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that it's that thing of uh, feeling completely um, um, mysterious, but totally familiar at the same time, and you've never felt it before, mm -hmm. but it's never going to go away. Yes. And um, where that is coming from, I think. You know, without getting too flowery about it, but I do think that's what me and Bert, when, when you're improvising, that's what yeah. we're going for. We're not yeah. having a jolly up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, also, the idea of these guys, you talk about the word bohemian, and you talk about the way yeah. that they get set off on their lives and they stick to it, you know. John Martin was another one as well, you know, uh, almost sort of risking their lives in a way, is this commitment to this thing that's almost pure music and it's not worried about the commercial side, it's, it's almost sort of ignoring that completely. And there is an element of you with your with your guitar playing life that you've just set out on the road, you know. And some people look at it suspiciously, you know. You're yeah. doing all sorts of things. You're mixing with all sorts of people. <laughs> but it's like it's, it reminds me a little bit of that spirit. You're just out now. You're playing the guitar. This is what you do. You're on the road. You know. It's like, it's like Dylan's Never Ending Tour. Yeah. You're just out there now. You're just playing the guitar. You know. Yeah. And it's always a surprise who you turn up with next. But it seems to be part of that thing. I, I totally see it's coming from that same place. Yeah, it's like, um, well, that thing about being bohemian, the other thing also was that they were totally uncompromising in, in, in doing it. And that made total sense to me. It seems to be that's what a musician should do. Mm. Aside from the kind of, um, aside from the, the uh, you know, the, want, the wanting to entertain and the wanting to inform and all of that, um, the, those people like Martin Carthy and Bert and, and Roy Harper and, and their contemporaries. Um, the, 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 that thing I said about them looking down scornfully on people in the charts who are, who are put up now as being like uber, mm. uber cool. Um, that, it was totally uncompromising. And um, that seems to be a, it had to, maybe in my case, it, se it seems to be like um, a bit of a big deal, but I thought, Musicians are totally supposed to be uncompromising. Maybe it's just the time I came out of, yeah. but, but um, you know, that's, and following your own map, really. Yeah. That's, that's the, the thing that I think I have in common with them. Mm. Um, uh, while all the time it being about music, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess, I think, I guess sort of Neil Young sort of got quite a lot of that about him, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he, and quite rightly, he gets a lot of credit for it. But everybody should really, I mm. suppose, should should be sort of doing that. Because mm. I don't even think, if you you know, you asked ask quite a lot of musicians about it. I don't think they've even considered it. They sort of go, well, there's a lot of things to consider. You know, whether you can do it as a living. And yeah. I guess I've just been really lucky. But it's always been dead uncompromising.